Hello and welcome to the lesson on conservation of momentum in two dimensions. So what's the goal today? I want you to be able to explain the meaning of conservation of momentum in two dimensions and then I want you to be able to apply it to the real world applications, so the questions we're going to be dealing with. So law of conservation of energy applies to any situation in which a system is subject, subject to a net force of zero. This would include situations that contain two dimensional forces. So to deal with this particular scenario or situation, we're going to have to go back and deal with our vectors. So what we are really trying to do here is we know that our momentum is going to be, say, we'll, let's deal with two vectors. So momentum one plus momentum two is going to equal momentum one prime plus momentum two prime. What we're really looking at in a lot of these questions, we are looking for a particular unknown. So we may be looking for the final momentum of row two. So that means that, or sorry, the new momentum for number two. So this is what's going to happen. We'll take momentum one plus momentum two. And if we are looking for trying to solve for this unknown, that means I'm going to subtract the momentum for number one, final momentum for number one from both sides which means we end up with a statement that looks like this. All right, now, then we can slide into vector form. So I'm just showing you what it would look like. What we end up with then is our stacked addition notation plus momentum two minus momentum one prime and that resultant or what we're going to be looking for, the unknown, will be like that. So we'll do that stacked vector notation with our I's and our J's. All right? So essentially, and this is why I said you're going to be dealing with vectors so much in the 4U course, it's because we bring a lot of 2D stuff into it. All right? So let's take an example here. And when you're approaching... When you're approaching these questions, it's probably a good idea or a good habit to get into in drawing the before and after diagram. All right, so I always give myself a before diagram. So a steel ball of mass 0.5 kilograms moves at a velocity of 2 meters per second east. So there is my momentum of my steel ball. Strikes a tennis ball of mass 0 0.3 kilograms initially at rest. So I'm not going to draw that vector. Because it's at rest, that means it has no momentum. So I hope we're at a comfort level where if I put this in, I'll put it in, I guess, for the first example. Momentum for the tennis ball is zero. The A for after, what happens then? They collide. Steel ball has a velocity 1.5 meters per second east, 30 degrees north. So there is momentum of the steel ball prime, the after collision. And we're looking for what happens to the tennis ball. So this is where some intuition comes into play. If the steel ball strikes the tennis ball and heads off in that direction, well, I'm going to kind of assume that the tennis ball is going to head off in that direction. So I'm going to see if my anticipated result is going to be the uh, same as what the answer comes out to be. So what does that mean in terms of the formula? Well, and I'll do it out, and some people are going to be able to start cutting corners here. I shouldn't say cutting corners, but being able to jump steps here. So there's the formula. Momentum before is equal to momentum after. We know the tennis ball had no momentum to start. I'm looking for the momentum of the tennis ball. So that means it's the momentum of the steel ball minus the momentum of the steel ball after is going to equal the momentum of our tennis ball. That being said, I now know what my vector addition is going to look like here. So my steel ball minus the resulting of the steel ball, the resulting momentum, is going to give me the momentum of my tennis ball. So momentum of the steel ball prior to the collision. Remember that momentum, I'll do this off to the side as a bubble here. Momentum is mass times velocity. So mass of the steel ball, so 0.5 kilograms. Velocity is 2, and it is all in the x component. And it has no y component, so it would be 0 
J. I can't make a J properly. There we go. So there's the momentum of the steel ball prior to the collision. The steel ball afterwards, well, it's going to have the same mass. So 0.5 times, oops, now the velocity's changed. Its new velocity is 1.5. And now we have to bring in the components because it's at an angle. So it's going to be cos 30i. And because that vector, just as a reminder, the vector here is positive x and the y component is positive y. So that's why it's going to be plus 0.5, 1.5, sine 30, j. So there we go. We now are set up to do our subtraction. So I'm going to do the calculations here. And what I found when I did my calculations is that it was 0.35i minus 0.38j. So that is the resulting momentum of the tennis ball, which is supported by my intuition. I figured it would be heading off in that direction, positive x, negative y. So now I can determine the magnitude of the momentum. So the magnitude of the momentum of the tennis ball is the square root of 0.35 squared plus negative 0.38 squared. When I do that calculation, I get a magnitude of 0 0.52 kilogram meters per second. Now I need to find an angle. Actually, I don't really need to find the angle now that I look at it because all I want to know is the velocity. Well, no velocity is a vector. I apologize. I was looking ways to trim it, but don't, not, can't do that. So that is the tan inverse of y over x. So the 0 0.8, 0 0.38 over the 0.35. Extend the page a little bit here. So tan inverse 0.38 divided by 0.35. And I get an angle of 47 degrees. I'm going to call it 47. Close enough. Now I want to know what the velocity is. So I know the momentum. Remember from above, up here, momentum is mass times velocity. So now I have the magnitude of my momentum. So that means I can say, so my momentum of my tennis ball afterwards is mass times velocity. Well, I know it's 0 0.52. Mass of the tennis ball was given, 0.3 kilograms. V, so therefore my V will equal the 0.52 divided by 0.3. And I get 1.7 meters per second. And the direction on that would be heading east, 47 degrees south. So therefore... The velocity is 1.7 meters per second east, 47 south. And there we are. We're using vectors to solve the problems at hand. All right. So looking at the next one, two kilogram rock is thrown without velocity. Rock hits the window, breaks into two pieces. So the first, the before situation here. Okay, so the rock is thrown with a velocity, um, and I'm going to say it's heading in that direction. This is not giving an angle, so there is the momentum of my rock. Afterwards, one piece of the rock bounces off the window with that velocity, 45 degrees to the horizontal. So I'm going to say that the first piece of rock went that direction. What's the velocity of the other piece of the rock? So, again, you can do something in, to anticipate. I know that the total momentum was to the right. Okay, so when I look at this situation, I have two options. The other piece of rock could have went over here. The second piece. So that's one option. Or it might have went through the window. It might have went over here. So both of those components would cancel out or... Uh, make the equation balance. So I don't know exactly what's going to happen. So situation one or situation two. So vectors tell us, tell us everything. So we know the momentum of the entire rock has to equal momentum of the first piece and the second piece. 
we want to know the second piece information about the second piece. So doing our manipulation here, it tells me how to set up my vectors. So I know that the rock, momentum of the rock minus the momentum of the first piece is going to give me the momentum of the second piece. Now I just need to do some calculations. So the original rock, the assumption is it was heading straight to the right, 9.5, I will have no Y component. The second rock, remember you need to do your components properly, so it will be a negative X value, so negative 0.65, and the velocity is 1.7, and it would be cos 45, that gives me my I component, plus the 0.65, 1.7, sine 45, and that's my J. So now I just need to do some calculations. And there is the resulting momentum when I do the calculation. Now, when I, uh, from there I want to find my magnitude of the momentum. So I'm just using this formula again. Plus negative 7.8 squared. And we find that the momentum of that second piece of rock is 21.3. So we need to calculate an angle here. So theta would equal tan inverse of the 7.8 over the 19.8. And we get 21.5 degrees. Determining the momentum then of rock 2, it's mass times velocity. So I know that the momentum was 21.3. Mass would be uh, 2 minus the 1.6, or 0.65, sorry. So 1.35V. So the velocity, 21.3, divided by 1.35. I get 15.8 meters per second. One of the reasons I like this example is that that chunk of rock sped up because of the momentum change in the difference in mass and stuff. So therefore, final velocity is 15.8 meters per second. And the direction would be, because that component up here is positive, oops, okay, it's going to be east, then it's negative, so it would be south, so east uh, oops, 21.5 degrees south. So it turns out it was actually what we anticipated was the red vector. That's the resulting direction. And yeah, the velocity started at 9.5 and that chunk that broke off actually sped up. And, that, and that's because of the conditions of that second rock. It slowed down so much that that momentum was passed to the second piece of rock and because of the mass difference it increased its velocity. So I have one final example then to finish up the note and then you can uh, head off to the homework but I can't stress enough the importance of using vectors. We'll see you in the next video.